Uh, hi, I'd just like to begin. Um, I'd like to begin firstly just by thanking the organizers and also thanking and calling into the room some of my collaborators in this work, particularly Zoe Todd, Patero Kalule, Carson Arthur, Katarina Tewa, Leon Sealy Huggins, and the grassroots organizers that I work with in Nauru, Fiji, Kiribati, the Marshall Islands, and Papua New Guinea. I also want to uh, thank Nabil for giving some introduction to the Pacific context. And in my talk, I want to bring some of the things that he's spoken about into more everyday and intimate realms to kind of connect across these scales, across these global scales, down to the everyday experiences that people in Pacific front lines um, are going through, and to embed some of these stories into specific lands over time. I just, uh, before I begin, I'd just like to take, you know, 30 seconds for people if you just kind of want to you know, take a bit of a breath. That was a lot of information that Nabil gave. And also just to give you a little bit of a warning that this talk is is quite intense. So I just kind of wanted <laughs> um, to just kind of take a moment for people to just, you know, just be in your body, see how you're going, just kind of get comfortable, you know, shift around whatever it is, you know, that you might need to do. Okay, I'm going to begin now. <laughs> I hope everyone's moved around enough. The lilting cry of the reed warbler, endemic to Nauru, echoes across the topside phosphate mining pit, which is littered with bulldozers and trucks now lying idle. It is 6.15 p.m. and the tropical dusk is falling. A few kilometers away, groups of Nauruans are gathering to catch migratory noddy birds, lured into nets with recordings of their own calls. The roads leading to the mines and between the detention centers are busy with activity. Australian Border Force agents, international health and medical services workers, construction workers and mine personnel clamber into air-conditioned minibuses and jeeps to ride the dirt road down to the coast while refugees and asylum seekers on dirt bikes navigate their way around potholes and rocks to return to their tents and shipping container homes adjacent to the mines. Amongst this activity, the pits are silent, save for the hum of mosquitoes, the roar of wind and the sea crashing below, below on the shore. The reed warbler cries out in anticipation of response. There is only one at some point. I sit and listen for over an hour waiting for more birds to appear. This is what I hear. In the end, the birds do not appear, and so I leave. I begin this talk with this excerpt from my journal for my project, Climates of Listening. 
I wrote these notes on the 5th of October 2018. It was a humid night, so damp that water dripped off leaves onto my skin, so dark that only the lights from the detention centres housing incarcerated refugees and asylum seekers pierced the sky as I sat, listening. Listening to the sounds of ecocide, wrought in part by my ancestors, broadly speaking, by violent imperialist regimes that kept Europeans in capital profit. The sounds of indigenous lands mined to destruction, resources taken from the ground for over a century to bolster the agricultural economies of colonial states across the oceans. In the time that we have together today, I want to think about how sound and sonic practices might open other ways of approaching the durations and impacts of social environmental destruction, of ecocide, like those that have been occurring in Nauru for the past 114 years, which are compounded and exacerbated by the impacts of climate change, drought, sea level rise, water shortages, heat increases and coral bleaching. I want to think correlatively about how sound calls us into account as listeners across space and time, as interlocutors of slow disasters and crises. Many methods exist for paying attention, for becoming attentive. For me, listening is always fundamentally about attunement, being attuned to the world in ways that are appropriate to what I am attending to, not only through oral listening. Attunement means to tune into, to listen and to make adjustments, to build harmonies or relationships between things. Attunement in my work requires tuning into places that honor their specificities. It is about how we make relations and how we coexist. Attunement is predicated on asking questions. It invites us to encounter unknowns and more crucially, what is unknowable. So today I'm going to demonstrate how some of the practice of, of listening that I work with ground understandings of ecocide and how it entangles social, economic and ecological stakes. I'll be focusing specifically on my work in Nauru, a large ocean Pacific island state four and a half thousand kilometers away from Australia and 50 kilometers south of the equator. Since 2001, Nauru has housed Australia's offshore prisons. It is also a frontline nation affected by severe climate change impacts which endangers the lives of indigenous Nauruans and the refugees who remain there. The geophysical site of Nauru exemplifies a number of concurrent violences, a case study that reveals the intersections of resource extraction, carceral politics, and pervasive, normalized systemic environmental racism. Rather than approach, sorry, this is a map of Nauru and where it sits. So you can see its distance there from Australia, Papua New Guinea, Marshall Islands, Kiribati, Vanuatu, Solomons, and, and that's a fairly basic map of Nauru with its roads there and major buildings. Rather than approach Nauru from the position of a case study, however, through listening I am taking up what Métis scholar Zoe Todd refers to as kin study, as thoughtful, careful and plural hyperlocal ethnographies to counter the ways that the overwhelmingly white, Eurocentric academic and global policy discourses of global warming erase the local specific experiences of devastation faced by marginalised communities. By taking up this shift from case study to kin study, it is possible to consider more expansively how listening might call us to reflect on who we are, particularly for those of us who are white Europeans, what we enact and are beneficiary of, and how we might come to be otherwise. I was first invited to Nauru in October 2018 by the Department of Commerce, Industry and Environment to speak with public servants, community leaders and representatives of NGOs about their climate mitigation and adaptation strategies. My intention in taking up this invitation was to document the impacts on the island's reefs, lagoon and landscape, and to amplify how communities were organizing to determine their own political agendas and spaces. Because I was hosted during this time by the department, I was afforded access to the island in ways that may have been uh, less available to others coming in. Nauru has been largely inaccessible to non-Pacific Islanders over the past decade, as it has been one of three Pacific sites for the offshore incarceration of asylum seekers and refugees, the others being Manus Island in Papua New Guinea and the Australian territory of Christmas Island. 
On Nauru, over 2,000 asylum seekers and refugees, uh, including children, were detained indefinitely in camps and temporary accommodation, while resettlement claims were processed in Australia. Nauru is a site of deep ecological, environmental and political tension, both historically and contemporaneously. The offshoring of human detention constitutes one of the more recent trajectories of Australia's neo-colonial operation across the Pacific region, a role that unfolds from a legacy of the Commonwealth-driven extraction of natural resources. Nauru was first colonized in the late 1800s by Germany, who sought to exploit the island's plentiful reserves of phosphate, which is the basis of fertilizer. In the early 1900s, Britain brokered a deal with the German government and the Pacific Phosphate Company to begin large-scale mining, which as Barnab and Fijian scholar Katerina Teowa has shown, was crucial to building Australia and New Zealand's agricultural industries. After the First World War, Australia, Britain and New Zealand took over full trusteeship of the island, which served as a strategic military site and was successively occupied driving indigenous Nauruans to the brink of extinction. It was not until the late 1960s that Nauru finally regained independence and took over mining activities. By this time, there were already signs that accessible land would become an issue. Nauru is small, covering just 21 kilometers square. The mine has taken over more than 80% of Nauru's land, and although primary production is drawing to a close, the government is considering plans for secondary mining. That would extend extraction by about 20 years before the phosphate reserves are fully depleted and Nauru's only known exportable commodity is completely exhausted. This is causing immense friction as coastal erosion and a growing population is demanding more from the land. The mine area called Topside by Nauruans is like a moonscape. Huge limestone pinnacles reach skywards, punctuated by steep gullies into which I was warned people have fallen to their deaths. It is unbearably hot, humid, and inhospitable. This is also where the detention centers are, in close proximity to the mining sites. Much of my time in Nauru was spent topside, around the mines, and correlatively, the three prison camps. This made the area an uneasy focus of my conversations with people. What became very clear very quickly was just how enmeshed the social, ecological, and economic conditions were to the extent that it was impossible to cleave them apart. In an early conversation, I spoke with Anabar Community Chair Anne, who was very candid about the situation topside and its cascading social effects. So this, there is like, uh, there's a lot of land up there. I mean, if you have a look at the map, I mean, three quarters of the land when they say when they when they say three quarters of the land is being mined out, because it's a mining area. But then that's also three quarters of land that people could use, but we can't because you go there even if you get your land back. You're like you know I want my land back. You know it's not being rehabbed. You're just gonna get a land that's full of pinnacles, you know, or either it's not a pinnacle, it's just a hole. What are you gonna do with that? Because we were promised that once they mine the land, they'll rehab it for you. Hasn't done, hasn't been done. It's still in question. And then there's the government saying it's not us, it was the former government. It's the former government's fault. And then you look at the former government, where the hell are they? They're six feet under. You know? Really, when, they, when they, you become a government, you take ownership of the shit that happened. Where's the rehab? It's not happening. Now they're doing it secondary mining. Secondary mining is not people's choice. But it's an economic perspective. The government says we need this. Okay, we need that for survival, but then at the same time, the population is blooming on the outskirts. There's a lack of space. 
and then you have household crowding issues and then you have incestry issues and you know why there's like household disputes and a lot of things happening which those are the social impacts that are happening which they know and you know in any other freaking country you would see if you do if you had a look at what the social impacts of what you're doing you would know this would happen so this shrinking habitable land means that most of nauru's growing population is clustered along the edges of the island Around the north, coastal erosion eats away at the beach, leaving families with nowhere to go, as Green Climate Fund Readiness Project Coordinator Nodell told me. Coastal erosion is, uh, you know, um, I, in my opinion, I think it wouldn't be so much of a, it wouldn't have such an impact if, if, if the land at Topside was available, you know, if people could live there. Um, but, um, yeah, if, if 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 we have you know an increased population and uh, less area space, land area to live on the coastal, and there's still that big hole at the top, then, then yeah, it's going to create a lot of pressure. Climate change, how that that's just without climate change impacts. Now with climate change impacts coming into this, then uh, you yeah, know I mean you can only imagine. Um, um, with you know severe droughts and uh, you'd have no no area for like local agricultural growth and um, I think yeah it's, it's pretty obvious um, shrinking land there'll be uh, tensions you know people one thing I think I guess it's worth it's an interesting point is that seeing that everyone's a landowner in a room every land portion is divided up say one land portion is divided up in segments amongst in fractions amongst the family members that fraction gets smaller and smaller and smaller every generation and, and it's going to come to the point where it's ridiculously where someone owns like 0.001 of a certain land portion While seawalls protect some areas, they push the waves onto others, meaning homes are flooded either way. Periodic king tides cover the only road running around the island, limiting accesses to services and resources. Daris, the project coordinator for the third national communication project on the UNFCCC, described this in some detail, charting also community responses to it. Before I started working with CIE, um, I've noticed around the community that we've been getting a lot more king tides and it's uh, especially in the northern area of the island. Um, one year specifically, um, I think it was uh, 2012, we had about 10 king tides and that was very unusual for us. We don't normally experience king tides that often, it's mostly at the end of the year during rainy season and all that, but now it's just more constant, more frequent. We, we weren't prepared for the, this to happen, so most times um, people are evacuated from their homes because all of a sudden the waves come rushing into their houses and all that, so there's no, there's no precautions taken, there's no warnings, warning people that this is gonna happen because it just happens, we don't have any warning systems in place and um, I think um, we just uh, we weren't we weren't prepared for climate change and I think that's mostly because uh, we don't really know about climate change I for me personally I didn't know anything about climate change before I started working with the department I've heard of climate change, but I didn't know the effects of it. Um, the community, I'm not really sure what the community is doing, but um, there are some government projects 
to build sea walls and all that but um, it's not I, it's not all around the affected areas because it's a um, pretty large area so um, I think the well the new seawall in Anatana I think the purpose of it was to um, redirect the waves but then it's causing causing um, another problem in another area of the island because when they redirect the waves it's going to another part of the island and that place is being flooded so there's um i don't i'm not really sure about community projects to uh, deal with uh, waves but uh, there are other projects in place that are um how do you say they're trying to teach educate the community to take care of their beaches and grow more uh, plants along you know to save their beach from erosion and all that. Obviously they don't have a choice. They can't move inland because there's no land to build on. There's no land to build on so basically you just you can move further in but it's still close to the coast because the safest area is just not there. It doesn't exist for anyone to to actually build on. Coastal erosion is uh, Salt start... from the sea also leaches into the groundwater supply. The water table is already contaminated with rubbish, mining effluent, and even leaks from cemeteries. While most of Nauru get it, gets its water from the desalination plant, the delivery of the water can take a long time, and when something goes wrong, experts have to be flown in to fix it. Rainwater is another option, but not everyone has a tank to catch it and severe droughts are increasingly common. The drought increases the movement of dust from the mine, which causes major respiratory issues. It covers houses near the harbour where the phosphate is processed and shipped. Dara said that people living in Iwo refer to it as snow. Yeah, well, in the Iwo, Iwo, the mining has had a really big impact on the community especially in uh, terms of dust and all the industrial work that's been going on. Like I mentioned, the pipe, pipelines and all that. Because um, if you go around Iowa, any family can tell you that there's uh, oil coming up from the ground. Maybe they hit a, an old pipe or something or sewage coming up from the ground. And the dust Every day, every day the dust settles on the houses when you wake up in the morning, we actually call it snow. <laughs> we actually call it snow because we wake up and everything is white. White and dusty and uh, we can't open our windows. We can't open our windows. Because the dust just comes into the house. And it's, um, it really affects uh, in health-wise. Most of the families in Iowa have uh, um, breathing problems. As, they're asthmatic, like from my family. Uh, both me and my brother have asthma, but it's not that bad as other families. So yeah, the mining really has a big impact on Iowa. Over the years growing up, we've heard of uh, our parents going up to the government and asking for help you know if they can just handle the dust problem it'd be good but we don't we try not to you know make it a big really big issue because we realize we understand that that's where the the country's money is coming from so we don't want to make a big issue because it'll affect everyone else on the island, but still it's causing problems for us, especially in the Iowa community. The words of Anne, Nodell and Darius, evidence often unspoken and undocumented truths about the everyday lives of environmental racism and violence. The root of testimony is testis, to witness, Oral testimony is to verbally witness, to tell one's truth. This truth-telling is always deeply embedded in relations of power. 
In fearless speech, Michel Foucault states that in Parisio, or free speech, the speaker uses his freedom and chooses frankness instead of persuasion, truth instead of falsehood or silence, the risk of death instead of life and security, criticism instead of flattery and moral duty instead of self-interest and moral apathy. These testimonies were given despite the threat of punishment for speaking out against both the mining activities and the Nauruan government's handling of its economy. In early 2018, the government passed the Administration of Justice Act, which gave the government legal power to hold in contempt any person scandalizing a judge or the court or the justice system in any manner whatsoever, including the publication, picturizing, uttering or ridiculing of a judgment or court order, the recording of court proceedings, the criticism of any witness parties, uh, judicial offers or legal representatives, and any attempt to predict the outcomes of court proceedings, both in Nauru and overseas. Compounding this for the past several years, the Nauruan government, jointly with the Australian government, has heavily curtailed and even fully banned the admission of any journalists and frequently researchers to the island due to strong criticism of the detention centres. Sensitive to the implications of speaking critically of the government and of referencing the detention centre, these conversations were more often than not highly circumspect. Many chose to maintain a pointed silence around the prisons, and it was only through listening to how certain topics were approached or considered, listening to pauses, redirections and evasions, that I was able to compose questions that helped to fill in some of the contours that the silences were outlining, without breaching what Fred Moten terms a right to obscurity. The refrains around land, health, resources, as touched on in the words of Anne Nodellandaris, shed light onto less articulated social concerns around territoriality, indigenous identity, xenophobia and competition for resources, as well as issues around family and gender-based violence. As much as witnessing and testimony is contingent on language, as Fijian scholar Una Isi Nabobobaba shows us, the ability to listen expansively requires sensitivity to other kinds of articulations, to uncapturable gaps and silences, to languages, dialects, and patterns of sound that are unfamiliar. An attunement to these other articulations can help us to encounter less obvious, slower durational processes. This kind of approach resonates with indigenous Pacific ways of apprehending land that does not disconnect environmental, cultural, and spiritual kinships and relationships. Woven through and guiding my conversations with people were Nauru's biophonies, the sounds of the geophysical landscape, the winds, the sea, the rocks and insects. Listening biophonies requires a commitment to stillness, repetition and curiosity. It also requires situating one's own body in space, being aware of how the body draws the world to it and disturbs the air around it. Over weeks I spent moving across pinnacles, mine equipment, seawalls and lagoons. I sat with Nauruans as they played bird cries into the air to catch knotty birds in large nets for food. I listened to urchins opening and closing with the tide. I listened to dogs barking at an incoming storm, and I listened to the sounds of wind whistling through phosphate rock. What haunted me in Nauru was the quiet. Even taking into account Nauru's minimal diversity, as many coral atolls have, the biophony was sparse. Biophony, environmental soundings, allows humans to observe animal habitats and territories and the relationships of polyphonic sound sources within them. These sonic territories are impacted upon by climate and weather, seasonal variability, temporal cycles and direct human intervention in activities such as industrial development and resource extraction. What sound, or the lack thereof, makes evident are the ways in which such processes affect the quality, diversity and composition of animal populations. The decimated land of Topside, while abundant in plant life, was absent of birdsong. Most stark was the absence of a dawn and dusk chorus Topside. While mined out and overwhelmingly hot, Topside, when I got there, was verdant with rain. And you can see that there's quite a lot of uh, foliage there. With no natural predators and extensive foliage, I was told by one of the environmental researchers that they thought that there would be several bird species around the area, including the endemic Nauru and reed warbler. This was not at all the case.
When I asked Irana, the Nauruan UN coordinator and biodiversity specialist about the lack of birds, she suggested that the mine had impacted the bird species. What I've heard that um, because of mining, a lot of, uh, because we don't have like all these native except one uh, bird species, but with even the bird species, I think it is known, the red warbler, Noron red warbler. Um, at one time they said the population uh, decreases. Um, they said all because of mining, that all the bed uh, has to go down, but then they have all these, um, I'm not sure whether it's a cat or dog being after them, so they're not uh, feeling safe, so they have to go up like in a different like trees or but then um, um, so I think it's just depending on whatever land activities that we're doing here in on land. The lack of either a dawn or dusk chorus compelled me to other sites. Anne, who lived next to a cemetery in Anabar, said that there were warblers there because of the dense trees. One evening, she sent two of her children to guide me up the hill behind their house. While there were more warblers than topside, the dusk chorus was still far less than I'd heard on other atolls, atolls that had not been mined to destruction. The people that I asked about the warbler asked other people. My questions got around and at some point someone told me that perhaps there were fewer of them because of the disease that struck down the noddy birds. Earlier in the year, they said, hundreds of noddy birds had succumbed to some unknown illness or toxin, some kind of invisible blight that left their bodies strewn across the ground and in the sea. Perhaps, they wondered, the warbler had also been affected. The warbler was more audible around the Buada Lagoon, a body of water reasonably distanced from the mining site. Surrounded by a well-established local farm, household gardens and tropical vegetation, the lagoon drew wildlife from all around. The lagoon was also full of fish, I was told. After sitting at different spots around the lagoon, I had hours filled with the light burbles of barely moving water, interspersed only occasionally with the soft sounds of introduced tilapia grazing on submerged vegeta uh, vegetation.
Around the reef, rather than the deep croaks of surgeon fish and coral trout or groupers, I mainly heard the pops and crackles of inedible snapping shrimps and the purrs of tiny, tiny damselfish, which again, completely inedible. Across the Pacific, I had recorded cacophonous, abundant fish songs. In Nauru, I recorded their absence. When I asked John from the Nauru Fisheries Marine and Resources Authority, he told me that the mining dust covered the coral reefs and that there had been a sharp decline in reef fish due to the heat and what he suspected was coral bleaching. He said that few fish could withstand the conditions in the lagoon because of the extreme toxicity of the groundwater polluted by mining effluents, salt water and garbage leakage. Field recordings, when woven together with oral testimonies, help to register these complex environmental interconnections. Acoustic ecologist Al Murray Schaefer argues that the general acoustic environment of a society can be read as an indicator of the social conditions which produce it. Sound can invite a different perception of what comes to constitute an expression or articulation of experience. Paying attention to the sonic dimensions of environments is a practice fundamental to Pacific culture. Of course, the translation of these sounds did not always sit smoothly with people's experiences or expectations, and this is where a necessary tension lies. Sounds are never just one thing, and neither are their interpretations. The importance of this was emphasized to me by Teviriki Terero, an Ikiribas poet and educator. In terms of listening, I think, I wish we could do more listening, but you know, the. There's always something that even the plants are telling us. So we need to listen to those uh, subtle messages because the messages are very subtle. We need to develop a third ear in order to be able to listen to that. Uh, two ears, one mouth, don't talk too much. You know? you have to learn to listen more. Not only to hear, but to be able to develop another thing, and that is to be able to interpret. You know, these things are different. They occur at different levels. The hearing and the interpretation of, of the sounds. Yeah. So it's very much part of our world. Environmental sounds, animal sounds, non-linguistic verbal sounds are all translated, mediated into language. The translation of sound into social knowledges is always representational. And this is acute in the case of translating indigenous Pacific to Western knowledge by a non-indigenous person such as myself. For John Solomon and Naoki Sakai, representation cannot help but be coercive because of the fundamental inability to convey the exact resonance of an articulation and the replication of institutionalized hierarchies that the activity of translation upholds. The constraints to translation and the power, no, uh, power endemic to knowledge production and its forms of legitimation is precisely why we need to keep thinking about how sounds are used and to what ends. The question of translation also speaks to wider questions on who is listening and how. Attunement in my work takes place through prioritizing indigenous Pacific knowledge, voices and practices. My work requires me to sit for days and months with people holding their stories of power and self-determination, rage, accusation, fear, pain, joy and love sitting for, with people as they grieve and cry, as they celebrate life, as they recover and repair. Sitting for hours in oceans, rainforests, mangroves, listening to the ebbs and flows of tides and rainstorms. It means hours spent in strip mines and on sea walls. 
Attunement means letting people and places tell me what they want from me, what I can be in service of, and becoming familiar, even comfortable with what is incomplete, unknown, and ultimately incommensurable. Attunement then is a practice that for me starts with an acceptance of what I don't know, and also very crucially, what is not mine to know, what is none of my business to ask or to be told. The everyday racist violence against and displacement of Indigenous peoples through resource extraction and economic disadvantage enacted by Australia and Pacific communities positions me as a beneficiary, and this must always be addressed. Being attuned means thinking about my relation to the places that I inhabit and profit from, and openly working from this position no matter how hard it is. Listening makes me aware that there are protocols of engagement that ask me to identify myself in relation to my surroundings, and that require me to acknowledge that my body can very well be a disturbance, even inappropriate and unwanted. My body has consequences. When I got to Nauru, I noticed how much my German mother tongue shapes the island's post-contact languages and dialects. I heard how the English I speak was coerced into mouths to erase other words and expressions. In listening, I hear how my histories echo in the present sounds of the Pacific as ongoing dispossession. Being attuned to Nauru asks me to grapple with what it means to be a guest, a trespasser, and a colonizer. As white Europeans, and I am speaking directly to all of the white Europeans uh, in this audience, we are not taught how to encounter thresholds, how to move into unknown territories without territorializing them with our bodies, thoughts, arguments, and presuppositions. Listening shows that there are many ways to ask permission, and that permission needs to be sought again and again of places as well as people. Attunement is what makes me aware when it is time to give thanks and to leave, which is one of the most crucial lessons that we can learn. The history of missionization, material extraction, and occupation in Nauru makes listening then as a white European an uncomfortable practice because I can hear my past and my present. And this is what listening to Ecoside needs. It needs us, as listeners, to face what lies behind and underneath what we are taught to hear. Our discomfort at the violences, the environmental racism that we benefit from, shows us that there is something that requires our close attention, because through our unease, we can learn more of who we are. There is a necessity to naming ourselves as a listener, to situating ourselves to make sure that our inheritances are clear. Listening requires me to attend to just how horrific and unrelenting the consequences are of Europeans defining ourselves as human and black and indigenous people as fungible and exterminable. Through listening, we might learn how to make systemic reparations towards peoples and a world that we are doing our best to destroy. As artists, as listeners, we pay attention to the worlds around us, real and imagined. It is our practice to dispose ourselves to the places we move through and we hone ourselves to become translators. Colonial dispossession and its contestation is heard in language and in the sounds we often don't attend to. In Nauru, the sounds of mining and land being cleared, the sounds of detention, the sounds of self-determination. They are also heard in quiet, the intermittent cries of the reed warbler, the surgeon fish who did not sing, in the gaps in stories that are filled with eyes pulled into the distance, a word cut off before the final syllable is said, sentences broken apart and truths indicated with euphemisms or questions with no answer. Listening has taught me that to speak of ecocide means to build relations from and with places like Nauru in ways that disallow abstraction, that anchor your body to the ground, to the air and to the sea. To understand ecocide as something that is of the world that I am of as well is crucial to moving away from the one-dimensional stories of collapse, of the end times, or of white saviors and technocratic solutions. It has become open to incommensurability because to approach ecocide from attunement is to see that even the starkest silence speaks of life, even if we can't hear it.
Thank you.